just kidding. Oh. <coughs> oh, is it? It's, it's real. Good evening and aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Tuesday evening. It's time for Tuning Up with Iggy and Day, presented to you by the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, live from this beautiful Hawaii Theater Center. Dave, how are you today? I'm very excited. You're very excited because? Yes, because I feel like we're on an episode of The Voice tonight. We've got our four judges. We're all going to turn our chairs around. That's the right show, right? I don't watch TV. Yes, okay. yes. It's been and a while then, since I watched And it. then we're going to announce the winners of the Na Hoku Opio, uh, our Young Stars program. And what better way to do that than this evening than with two of Hawaii's best educators? Educators, violinists, artists, teachers, mothers, but last but not least, holders of uh, doctors of uh, uh, DMA music arts. Sorry, I, I'm not a DMA myself, so I had to think about it. The doctors uh, are in the house. So happy to welcome Dr. Yusan Nam, Dr. Nikki Ebisu. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. How, let me ask you first, how nervous are you? Are you, do you get nervous uh, being in front of Dave? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually pretty nervous. Pretty nervous. Yeah, I, know, yeah. I know we were uh, very eager to ask you to come on the show, but both of you were like, yes, I think, but uh, let me first check. Are you, son, uh, are you nervous? A little bit. A yeah. little bit. A little bit of uh, uh, maybe <laughs> this is after hours. We're not teaching. None of us are teaching anymore tonight, so we have a little bit of a... Uh, of a, of a drink. Aren't you always teaching, Iggy? <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh, okay. All right. So am I the one announcing today's wine? Or should let's, we announce that? Well, Hold let's off start bit. with how people could reach us this evening if they liked uh -huh. you. Would you like to show us uh, how they might be able to the, uh, text questions? So I, you know, how many episodes have we had? 36, 37? 30, this is 37. This is number 37. So I still don't know the number to text to, but I know that I'm supposed to go like this. So please use that number to text <laughs> questions you may have about the orchestra, the symphony, about Dave Moss, if you have any questions for him, uh, or to Dr. Yusan Nam, Dr. Nikki, uh, we're looking forward to hear from all of you. Uh, we also want to thank you for being so uh, faithful to the symphony and to the show for supporting us week after week. What are we drinking this evening, Iggy? Again, I'm, I feel like I'm doing all the talking tonight. Um, okay, so this is actually a wine from Central California, but it's called Le Cigar Volant which means the flying cigar, uh, the cuvée au mua mua, which I believe is a scout in Hawaiian. It's a 2018 wine, a mixture of Grenache, saint and Syrah grapes. I drink it after the show. Uh, I believe, uh, Nikki and Yusan, you had a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> a sip. But I guess I'll keep talking. Oh, no, are we talking or are we not talking? Okay, the mics, how are we doing the mics? The mics are okay? Okay, good. Uh, how is the, the, the wine tasting? It's, uh, it's wonderful, Iggy. It's as beautiful as it sounded when you pronounced it. Great. So, we have a quiz question. Ah, That's yes. a good place to start. Yes, but first, that's the wine. why we, we talk about yes. the wine, because we have a quick, quick quiz question. The wine this evening is from our good friends down the street here in Chinatown, Hosser Wines. They support us week after week. Uh, and if you have the correct answer to tonight's quiz question, the answer is viola, um, you will win this bottle of wine. If you are over the age of 21 and live on the island of Oahu, we will deliver this to you. Iggy, take it away. Well, every week, sometimes we come up with brilliant trivia questions day by night, but sometimes the guests come up with brilliant questions. So, Yusan, please, you came up with this idea. Um, go ahead, please. Well, so, how many violin concertos did Max Brook write? Yes, and we're talking about single violin concertos. Yes, written for a solo violin, not counting the... Others. Uh, 
Yeah, and the Scottish fantasy. And the Scottish fantasy, absolutely. So we're not counting concertos that include, say, viola. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So in fact, you know, I, uh, some, I, I was talking about those, um, uh, Max Bruch, and, and, and I was uh, doing a, a radio interview, and I said on the, on the air, you know, but he's one violin concerto. Anyway, I, I got scolded later because I gave the wrong answer. I mean, I didn't know what the right answer is. But anyway, uh, Dave. So how many violin concertos has Max Bruch written? Well, the winner will get the wine bottle. Yeah, and the wine inside of it, not just the bottle. <laughs> okay, okay, on to the show. Dave, Yes. please start it off. I always like to ask the very simple question of take us back to the beginning. Who are you asking first? The f Oh. <laughs> oh, me? Okay. Yes, Nikki. Um, well, my story is a bit... Mm, different than this, the usual uh, music student, but um, I take it back to the beginning as my music career. Sure. Okay, well. Um, the beginning can be anything beginning, you want it to be. Oh, that, that goes deep. But, um, well, my music career actually started before I was even born, uh, surprisingly. My music, my mother met uh, Dr. Suzuki before I was even born. Um, that's Dr. Shinichi Suzuki, for, um, the founder of the Suzuki Method. And um, she, I was, she was living in Denver, Colorado, and Dr. Suzuki, I'm sure many of you have seen the, um, the photos or the video footage of Dr. Suzuki with all those little children, mm -hmm. like four years old, playing the Bach Double Concerto. Um, so he brought his tour group to Japan, I'm sorry, to the U.S., and um, he, was, he had a U.S. tour. And so my mother saw this and uh, was just mesmerized by this and said, okay, my future child is going to do this. And so um, I think she might have been pregnant with me. So she decided, okay, this is what my future children are going to do. And uh, read all his books and met, walked up to him and said, what do I need to do? And he said, you need to listen to the recording six hours a day. And so I think 20 years later, I asked her, did you really do that? And she says, of course I did. So well, no wonder I... I kind of went crazy, but um, so that's that's where I started, and I um, I think maybe when I was two and three and four in Denver, Colorado, I observed people's lessons. Um, I didn't actually touch a real violin until I was maybe four. What and did you touch before that? What uh, were you a macaroni box with a ruler? I was a carpenter violin, carpentry, you know fake wooden violin oh, fancy. with a, okay. with a, you know, like this. I'm a Suzuki kid as well. Hey. And we've discussed the, um, Knuckles. the, um, the Suzuki pre-violin, pre-violin, yeah. cracker, cracker jack right. box. Or, yeah. or is a, yeah. Today we use foam violins. Technology. I know. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. How old I'm sorry. were you? <laughs> two? Two. Yes. Okay. Three, two, three. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Yes. So, um, so Moving forward, I moved to Japan around the age of four, and I finally actually got to study with Dr. Suzuki's um, assistants. Uh, in, I lived in Tokyo, but I, I had the privilege of studying with Dr. Suzuki some in group lessons and um, interacting with him uh, every summer. And, uh, and then around the age of nine, I want to say, I completed the Suzuki method, and I moved on to the Toho uh, Music uh, preparatory college prep program, Toho Academy, uh, to Toho College Universities. Um, it's pr probably the equivalent of Juilliard in Japan. So, uh, and I went on to do that. Uh, I studied with Sumiko Edo Sensei, and um, she's actually a violist. Oh. Uh, so I have maybe violist technique. Hey, but um, I'm a violinist. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to interject in of the course, middle of please. your viola talk, but. Um, I assume that a lot of students in Japan want to study with Dr. Suzuki. Suzuki. How did you get to his uh, studio? Well, I mean, I didn't study with him, only, in, only him. I studied in Tokyo at the Suzuki um, Talent Education Institute. Um, so th there, he has many schools in Tokyo. But um, if you participated in his summer program in the Matsumoto, okay. um, 
yeah, I mean, you just had to be a very loyal participant of his program and you got to study with him. So it was, yeah, I guess my mother was a very dedicated, very dedicated. My brother studied Suzuki cello. Um, yeah, so it was, it was lots of years and lots of practice, but yeah. And I'm sure that. we'll get back to uh, the Suzuki method later yeah. on, but um, I also lived in Denver um, like between 92 and 97, so I don't know if you were there around that time, but that was uh, before me. Yeah, that was before your time. Of course, everyone's. Much or I, well, than I went me. back to Denver, so okay. yeah, after and you, you, I was there. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll yeah. get back to it. But then you, you got your DMA uh, yeah. from UC Boulder. Yeah. Um, you, son. Oh. Your beginning, please. Oh well, I mean, I guess you know, my mom wanted me to play music, so I started um, taking piano lessons when I was three. And then I started violin at the age of six or seven. Because she wanted you to, to switch to violin or because you wanted to play well, the violin? She yeah, signed me up for violin lessons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was her idea. It was her idea. Yeah, yes. Uh, I guess I wasn't like really progressing on the field of piano. Wait, is she a musician? No, no, no. Like none of my family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. But they love, they love music, so they wanted me and my sister to. Yeah, yeah, the music. And then uh, I went to arts middle school. Okay, so that's <laughs> actually a very renowned, famous Oh, yes, school. yes. What is the name in Korean? Oh, Yewon Middle School. Yewon like, Middle School. Yes, Yewon Arts Middle School. Yes, so... And again, just like Nikki, I'm, 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 I'm assuming a lot of kids want to get into that middle school yes very so complete. did you have to audition and play Pagani Caprice oh <laughs> yeah we had to audition and the audition piece was I remember Mozart violin concerto number no. five and Handel sonata for my ear well e yes so I went to arts middle school and actually you know Kiwon and Songchan okay so those yeah, are those um, are like um, two dear colleagues of the yeah orchestra. yeah in the, the yes. Kawaii symphony and also uh, Jinju Cho was also in our ear. Yeah, she uh, yeah. soloed with us. Hawaii uh, Symphony. Once really? or twice. I, mean, I think. She, twice. So, yeah, uh, she's or been to Hawaii twice. twice. Maybe she soloed with the orchestra once. But, uh, you were playing the Mozart what now when you were how old? I was 11, 12, and Mozart's violin concerto number no. five. Huh. Yeah, that was the audition piece. Wow. Because wow. yeah. usually you start three, four, five. I remember I did actually two or one later on, but... Uh, I was on, like, Suzuki Book 4 at that <laughs> point, so... Bravo. So, I'm sorry, you saw Please. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, and, and then I went to, like, uh, again, like, uh, arts high school. So, I mean, yeah, once you're you know, in the arts, like, in a middle school, your path is, you know, pretty much set, yeah, right? So, I didn't... Yeah, really... Yes, so... <laughs> and then... Um, then I came to America uh, after one year, of, one semester of college in Korea, because I wanted to study with Lee Kwan Bay, you know, yeah, at IU. So. But I'm sorry, but I think you're skipping an important part. You also went to a very prestigious college in Seoul, no? Oh, Seoul National University. Yes, that's yeah. a. And that's yes. kind of a very renowned school too. That's where my father. Uh, oh, went. you're. Uh, oh. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, you spent one year there, and then you one semester one there. Semester. Yes, because in Korea uh, the school year starts in March, so I did you know like one semester, and then came to U.S. and yes. And so where did Dr. Lee Kwan Bay uh, teach? Oh, Indiana University. Indiana. We're went to the same school. Yeah, I'm an I, I'm a IU alum, except. I just was completely lost all the time I was there. Anyway, but you were... Um, I was there for six years. I did my undergrad and master's there, and that's where I met my husband, Michael Lim. <laughs> yeah, he was there. At the Wait, same. I know him. You know him? I think so, yeah. Oh, the vi violinist. Very the famous, same. yeah. <laughs> famous violinist. Son of a, a Dr. Jeffrey Lim, I believe, correct? Yes. <laughs> One of our dedicated associates as well. Yes. I think he's watching it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Is Mike watching? I think tonight? so, yeah. Okay, maybe. So we can say hello, Mike. Hi, Mike. Thank yeah, you for my being daughter supportive. Too, maybe. Yeah. Tonight is about your wife, not about you. 
<laughs> yeah, and then I, yeah, after six years at IU, I went to Eastman uh, to do my doctorate there, and I studied with Federico Agostini. Uh, he's the nephew of famous Franco Gulli. Right, yeah. so, so just to put things in perspective, again, I'm the oldest guy here on stage, and so um, uh, Yusan studied with <laughs> Agostini? Agostini, yeah, Federico Agostini. Federico Agostini, who is the nephew of Franco Gulli, and Franco Gulli is the teacher I studied with. Yeah, so very I'm, famous. I'm like one generation or two older than, than Nikki and Yusan. So, um, uh, Nikki, before uh, you, so I wanted to ask both of you, we're skipping through your masters, but a DMA takes a whole lot of commitment, hard work. You have to practice. You have to spend time in the library, and there are only 24 hours in a day. Um, what kind of de determination did you take? And once you started your DMA studies, did you know it was going to be that demanding, or did you expect it, Nikki? You know, it sounds really strange, but it was the easiest degree I got. Um, I know that I don't. And that sounds really strange, but and it's because I finally figured out how to study, um, and I finally figured out like what drives me and what interests me. Because my undergraduate, I was kind of like, oh, what do I want to do in my life? I don't really know. I was actually pre-med in my undergraduate, um, and my music degree was kind of like. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, my master's was also kind of like, I don't know where my focus is. Is it just chamber music? Is it solo? Is it orchestra? And, um, and finally, in my doctorate, I was kind of narrow. And you know, after studying and procrastinating, and you're not really motivated, and you really don't know what, where you're going in your life, finally, I was like, oh, I see. You have to study when you're given the assignment. And you have to get your paper done immediately and you have this is how you out take an out make an outline. This is how you, you listen and to a lecture. This is how you write a paper. And I was like, oh, this is actually kinda easy. And I mean it wasn't easy, but it was a lot easier than my first you two degrees. Focused. And I was focused and I knew what I was doing and I knew where my life was going and um, and I was actually still mid-degree when I moved to Hawaii. I moved to Hawaii for the symphony, actually. Um, and so uh, in my final year of my, I was, uh, we call it ABA, all but, uh, sorry, ABD, all but dissertation. Um, so I had done all my coursework and all I needed to do, all I needed to do was write an 80 page paper. But um, so I just thought, oh, how wonderful. I could play in an orchestra and I can just study and write my paper on the beach. So, um, but, so I moved to Hawaii um, in my final year of my doctorate. And, but it was so wonderful because I had this wonderful orchestra. Back then it was the Honolulu Symphony and, um, and wonderful people, wonderful music. And, and at the time we were struggling. It was um, 2006, I think. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it was just, I knew what I wanted and I knew what was driving me. And um, so it was, yeah. That Very was... interesting. Um, before I ask you some the same question, I, I, maybe I was spacing out, but Dave, we have, yes, did you have in mind when we would make the announcement about the Nahoku Opio in the middle? Are we saving that to the end? When the time is right. When the time is right, and Dave knows when the time is right. Uh, Yusan, yes. um, let me ask you something, and I'm, I hope I can ask it the, the right way. Uh, being sort of an international student, mm -hmm. a woman, did you feel that when you would tell people in the academia, or teachers, or students, or peers, whatever, that I'm doing a DMA. Did you ever come across people say, "Oh, you just should just you know not worry about doing a DMA, just uh, get married and, and you know"? Uh, did you have people come across and, and not taking you so seriously? Oh, never. Yeah, that's yeah, good. Never, yeah. Um, so at Eastman, you were fully committed. Um, tell me, did you practice? 
equally as much when you did your DMA or less? Oh, less, <laughs> definitely less. More studying, yeah, less practicing. And and ask. Uh, let me ask both of you. What was the topic of your dissertation? You son, first, please. Oh, well, I mean, at least when you can choose, you either write, you know, like a hundred page dissertation or either you write like four small like research papers, like 25, you know, pages. So I did that instead. And my four little topics were, one was German leader. I did, I wrote on um, Schubert, that's bad, Schumann, Frau and Liebe und Leben, <laughs> yeah, the song cycle, and the uh, okay, yes, sorry. and the uh, and Indian music. Oh, that was the hardest class I've ever taken. Indian music and the uh, one on American music, and the last one was twentieth century Eastern European. Yeah. And is is it a little bit like the same as Nikki, where you actually finish your DMA? in Hawaii or you, you finished everything before? Oh, I finished my coursework before I moved to Hawaii, but I had to take my, um, the oral exam. Okay, yeah, that's right. so I made a trip to East, like Rochester. Wow. And, sorry, 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 Dave. Um, did your parents say, were, were your parents supportive or did they say, well, you should just, you're done with, with school, you should not worry too much about, you know, for, or did they say, you know, you should do a DMA? Or, Oh, they were very supportive, yeah. Because yeah. sometimes, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how you feel, but sometimes Korean parents can, can kind of tell you what to do and when it's time to stop. And I I'm guess DMA that. was what they wanted. <laughs> the DMA was yeah. wanted. Sorry, Dave. Why was a violinist writing about song cycles? Oh, well... What was, the, your, was it your interest or...? Oh, well, that's the class I was taking. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Interesting. Yes, you have to take all these like, um, like classes, like music history or theory okay. classes, like not just in your like major, but. So the yeah. focus isn't a DMA on violin pedagogy. It's a broader range of musical knowledge. Yes. Yes, the history of the viola concerto, those important <laughs> facts that are important to all violinists. Um, Nikki, what was your dissertation oh, on? Uh, I won't make you defend it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can remember what it was. Um, I had one a lecture recital, but I, I had to write a 30-page paper first. That one was on Vignaski's um, Polonaise Brillant. Brillant? Oh. Can't even pronounce it. Um, and I had to say how the influence of Chopin was on that piece, and then I had to perform it, and then I had to lecture on it and present a paper. In that order? I, I had to write it, then I had to lecture it, then I had, then I had to perform it. Then um, my paper was um, Einheld, Strauss's Einheldenleben. Um, it's an orchestral piece. Um, for a big orchestra with a very famous orchestral solo mm -hmm. for a concert master. And um, I had to talk about how the, or the soloist, the concert master's bowings and fingering choices can actually af affect the, uh, the solo and, um, and the difference in the solo. So uh, I contacted all the major concert masters in our country including Minnesota, San Francisco, Cleveland, Boston, et cetera, et cetera. Minnes yeah, I think you said Minnesota already. And um, New York, and they, pres they provided me with their fingerings and boings, and I compared them. Really? And uh, yeah, I'd be did happy to share that with you. Uh, I certainly did. I'll share PDF them with you. I certainly do. I'll Tune in next week when Iggy does <laughs> all 10 of them. <laughs> and he chooses his favorite songs. I'm sure they have uh, nice violins too. Maybe I could wear their violins too. That's really fascinating that you went into that detail of I modern did. day yeah, yeah. performance yeah. practice, essentially. It was, was there anything? You don't have to release names. And then I names. became a Suzuki teacher. <laughs> you don't have to name names. Uh, no. but. Were there any that were just like outlandish where you were like, why is this an upbow? Yeah, yes. I won't, I won't name names. Okay. But there were some that I was like, why? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Did you have the opportunity to ask questions to them? Like, no. no. I okay. was just given them by the librarians. But okay. So they, they actually uh, willingly 
willingly, provided their willingly bowling shared, centurions. Willingly shared. Because... Uh, Some said no. Yeah, because uh, there's a famous French teacher at the Paris Conservatoire. Um, you would take a trial lesson or a few private lessons, and he had two sets of uh, rates. One was the higher rate where if he demonstrated with that, those left fingers, you could see what fingerings he was doing, and so you could write it on your own part. The lower rate lesson, he would cover his left hand <laughs> with a nice French <laughs> scarf. I don't know, maybe a Hermès or a Yves Saint Laurent scarf. Pretend this is a scarf, right? And then he would play like that and move his fingering. And so you had no idea what fingering he was doing. And that was the lower rate lesson. But he wasn't my teacher. So. Anyway, I'm glad those council masters yeah. are very generous. Yes, they were. Um, Yusan, I wanted to ask you. So I find that you're actually very quick. You pick up things fast. And um, again, I'm, I'm talking like when you're coming from Korea and you're going to school and you spend um, bachelor, masters, and DMA, you, you, your knowledge of English has to improve right away, but not just the, the talking English. Mm -hmm. Did you find that having to write so many essays and papers that your, your, your English understanding and writing got much better? Definitely, yes, yeah. And, you know, IU is known for, I mean, really, like, academic, right? Yeah, I had to write, like, many, many papers. <laughs> and, yeah, my, you know, I had a, like, uh, and, I mean, Mike helped me sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, I had a roommate, very nice roommate, yeah, was a terrific writer, so... <laughs> Yeah, because, yeah, but, okay, okay, go ahead, yes. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, at first, uh, yeah, my English was really bad, but then, yeah, after, you know, four years of college. And so, I, uh, sorry, uh, maybe I'm not ask, I'm asking the wrong question, but when I was at IU, so mm -hmm. I would see um, a group of Korean students, mm -hmm. and they would just um, be by themselves and, and talk Korean all the time. And, but I don't know exactly when you started to meet Mike, but... Mm. Have, meeting Mike, did that help your English? <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, by then already, yeah. By then you yeah, were yeah. yeah. And yeah. did you feel like uh, someone like Mike helped, have, helped you feel integrated in, in sort of the American culture? Yes. Yes and no, because you know, music school. There are so many international students. You know, not just from like you know Korea or Asia, but you know, from all of you know, like all over the um, world. So, like, I never felt like I was not you know, like a part of the community. Yeah, or, that's great. Yeah. yeah. And, and and Nikki, um, University of Colorado Boulder is where you got the UDMA. Was was that during the time of? Judith Glide as cellist. Yes, and, yes. Uh, was composer George Walker there? or Because I know his son, Greg Walker, was around he that time. He wasn't a professor at the, at the university. He was the concertmaster of Boulder Phil. Okay. But and your, yeah, I your didn't teacher him. was? Was Ozzie Leonard. Ozzie Leonard. Yeah. That's right. I, I, yes. I, I took a couple lessons when I was yep. living there. Yes. Um, is that where the Takash Quartet is? Yes, they're still there. Yeah. Yes, they're wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Did you get to go to their performances? Yeah, so all I got to study with them. So, yes. Yeah, amazing quartet. Yes, and their then Bartok there's recordings. Yes, they are wonderful. Yeah. And Judy Glide, who she's uh, he's referring to, is uh, was the cellist of the uh, Manhattan String Quartet. Yeah. So, and my teacher was the violinist of the Pablo Casals Trio. So, I had a lot of wonderful. Uh, influences and Erica Eckert is also still at a uh, viola, uh, viola player. She yes, was with Cavani, Erica. Cavani string quartet. Yeah. So former violist with yeah. Cavani string quartet. So wonderful, wonderful um, people at uh, University of Colorado. I did my master's there too. So what was it like being in, in an institution that was so heavily focused on chamber music? Oh, I think it was, it really taught me to uh, collaboration. Also, Ann Epperson was also there. She is a collaborative pianist and she started the collaborative piano program at University of Colorado and then she went to my alma mater, University of Texas. So it was just so wonderful to, it taught me how 
to be a collaborative musician, which it's not just like violin, piano, or just orchestral player. It's just, you know, it was something and mm -hmm. I really am so grateful for, you know, now because it teaches me, even now as an orchestral player, how to interact with my colleagues as a musician. I'm not just there doing my own thing. I'm really, you know, trying to interact with the other sections or with my concert master and, you know, the other sections. It, it changed me as a musician, mm -hmm. I think, you know. So. And Boulder is a fun town, I remember. Like, it is. It's, it's very different. You have Boulder and Denver and then Colorado Springs. But actually, a true story, Dave, is, is uh, I was in Boulder once and uh, I, I went to a, a bakery and they had a baguette, you know, and uh, you could sit down and have breakfast. So I didn't look at the menu. I just said to the waitress, um, could I please have just a hot chocolate, uh, a baguette, uh, some butter and jam? And uh, she said to me, yes, of course. Here in this bakery in Boulder, we call this a French breakfast. And I said, wow, I'll have that, please. So I had that. It's, it's a true story. I'm not you know, making that up at all. I You're speechless. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Yusan and Nikki, you're um, here because uh, you are both president and vice president of HMTA, Hawaii Music Teachers Association. Uh, I understand, Nikki, that HMTA is an affiliate of? MTNA, the Music Teachers National Association. And it has had, uh, HMTA has had illustrious past presidents and vice presidents. Um, I think Helen Chakesano was uh, a guest here and, and she was a past president and I'm sure I'm forgetting Ethel Lee Wasaki who's always tuning up, uh, um, Katie Luo, uh, Cheryl Shohei. Cheryl Shohei. Cheryl Shohei. Our, oh our my goodness, musician. Cheryl. I'm really sorry. I almost forgot you. I, not to be forgotten. Um, so um, tell us a little bit of HMTA and why you joined and, and what you're trying to do, especially the rough patch that we had these past years and how it's been to kind of maintain the membership and keeping them informed during the pandemic. Um, do you want to say? Do you want me to say? Okay. Well, um, HMTA is an organization that represents music teachers um, of all forms, we uh, classical music and more. And uh, we, it, it's uh, certainly been a rough path during COVID, um, you know, with with things being shut down. But that doesn't mean to say that we haven't been online. We've been trying our best to uh, reach out to people on Zoom and have workshops. Um, trying our best. Uh, we have a few more things um, in, that we're planning. Uh, we've. Um, in the spirit of you know diversity and inclusion, we've also been trying to reach out to our local artists and community. We just had an event featuring Raitea Helm and Aaron Mahi and George Kuo, and it was a wonderful event. Um, and they uh, taught a piece, uh, a Hawaiian song, and so we hope to do more of that uh, just to reach out to our local mm. community. And um, so uh, we, our goal is to foster our students and our and without our music teachers we don't have a future our future students and that's so important to us and many of our music teachers are members of the Hawaii Symphony so it's really important to us that we continue this organization and the growth of our organization and we reach out to other islands as well um, we do have members on Kauai and Maui and Big Island and so, and we continue to grow um, despite the COVID, you know, COVID. And so do, um, you know, look into our organization and we thank our donors who have um, been um, supporting our organization and we thank you. So um, that's what we're about. You've been do doing thank a lot you. of work. Yeah, thank uh, you. I on you, there were the HMT competitions and yes. I, I yeah. saw you were very much involved and <laughs> trying to yes. uh, write to all the parents and students yes. and organize online was was that a lot of work for you to set up yes it was it was a lot of work uh but you know like so the mtna last year the re regional is it the state, state. Uh, competition was online and we had like um 40. yeah 40 applicants like it's uh -huh. like yeah it's like uh, the year before it was like 10, 20 
Yeah. yeah. Or yeah, it was double. So that's yeah. sort of the silver lining of having the online competition is more people, more students enter. And also, uh, if it's in person, you have to hire local judges. But the silver lining, uh, you oh, said yes. you were able yeah. to find. Yeah, all the uh, with uh, judges from mainland. Yeah, all the you know like professors and uh, or you know like uh, players with the, like major symphony. Mm -hmm. So like all these great judges. Great, we great had the violist from the Cleveland Cleveland Orchestra, Orchestra principal. principal. Ah, yes. <laughs> As our judge. Very nice. Yeah. And Yusan, uh, you also gave a benefit recital. Oh, recent? Uh, yes. With. Yes. Uh, your quartet. Yes. Tell us a little bit about it. Oh well, it's a new, yeah, the newly formed quartet, 3.5 K. Okay, tell us why it's called 3.3.5 K. Oh, that should have been the trivia oh, question. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's 3.5. Can you guess? Well, I, I did because my wife took a guess, but yes. Oh yes, it's so a, we have we have Yu Sun, you have yeah, Kiwon King, Kiwon, Song Chan Chang, the cellist, and Michael Lim. Your husband. Can you guess? I already know, but oh. do you think you? Yes. Dave, do you know why it's called 3.5K? I don't. <laughs> so, okay, we, uh, it's 3.5 Korean, because we're like three full Koreans and uh, like half. I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dave yeah. is a runner, and yes. I'm sure he was busy oh. kilometers. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, so I, I actually um, um, tuned in for that reset of oh. this marvelous, uh, uh, which one? B flat major, Beethoven, and Shostakovich A? C minor and C minor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry, I mixed up my, my Beethoven. Ay, ay, ay. But I, I found that, that you were so unified played together. Mm -hmm. Like you were just like, like, like a bullet that's just so unified and just straight and, and just going where you needed to go. Um, <laughs> did you find that you had this similarity playing together or did you actually oh, work on it? I mean, we had to work on it, but you know, I think, yes, yeah, like the chemistry, yeah, was there because I guess, you know, the three of us, Ki Won, Song Chan and I, we've known each other since middle school. Yeah. And uh -huh. yeah, maybe like, you should say a little bit more about that middle school, that's, it's, well, very competitive. I don't know, like, like in Korea. So we have this playing exam at the end of every semester, and then they rank you from you know top to bottom. We had like 40 violinists, and then you know like rank one to 40. I mean, I think that's very cool. Yeah. But from like you know, uh -huh. like, yeah, like American Do standard. Do they still have it? Oh now? yes, yeah. Like from like. Like yeah, middle school, high school, even in college, and then the orchestra seating. You have to, yeah, say, like you know, one, two, three, four, like that. So, well, it's, so it's tough. I mean, like so. Yeah, very tough. The youngest age you are at that school is what? Ten years old or nine or? Oh, like seventh grade in like in America. So, so let me ask both of you: like, when you're a kid about that age, and you're told that you're forty out of forty. And, 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 you know, maybe it's happened to, I mean, not in a way, things like that have happened to me and things similar might have happened to you, but as now, as, as mothers and teachers, you see kids, you know, they're in that situation. How, what do you tell them to tell them, no, they're worth it. They're, you know, they, they've given all that effort and maybe they're 39 out of 40, but in the grand scheme of things, they're still, you know, as worthy as someone that's not. I mean, it's, do you find yourself dealing with students who sometimes have a low self-esteem because they've been there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, yeah, tough question. I mean, not just like playing or your major, but every right. subject was like that in mm. Korea. And it, it, I don't know if it's still like that, but, you know, like I was, like I don't know, like uh, um, like the like in the PE class, I was always in the like the bottom, you know, of like physical education. Yes, yeah. So, well, I mean, there's I enough think... pressure. I, I don't know, Nikki, how how your kids are older than than you, son. So, at some point, they're gonna experience maybe things like that. Are you, are you? 
I, it's easy for me because I don't have kids, but are you prepared to tell them how to deal with it? Yeah. I mean, as a mother, it's something I deal with, yeah, at home that I see, you know, and, and as a teacher as well, like, you know, not we're not going to be the best at everything that we do, but as long as you try, you know, and I can hear my son saying at home right now, there's no such thing as try. <laughs> you just do it or you don't. I can hear him saying it right now. But um, you know, as long as you give your best effort, you know, it's, you, you know, but what to what she was saying, um, in Asia, it's, it's so hard because that was actually, I mean, not to get too, too into it, but that was one reason I left Japan. Um, I left at the age of 13 um, was because of the cruel nature of competitive, how, how competitive it got. And I was, you know, I had a hardcore tiger mom and I was going to this really, you know, rigorous school of competitiveness. And I mean, I was a strong player, but I couldn't keep up with this, with, you know, it, it just was too much for me. And I just got so overwhelmed and, and being Hapa in a, in a Japanese country. I did go to an international school as well, but it was, it was very hard um, uh, at the Japanese music school, like she was talking about, I went to, um, it's intense. And you know, the, the, the better you are, the more catty the parents, right? The, the oh, don't be friends with that person because she's good. So, you know, I got bullied um, and it was hard and um, I finally couldn't take it. So I just, I picked up and I moved to the States and I moved um, to Oklahoma City, the year of the bombing. I don't know if you remember that. That was a big, 95. It's actually, well, I moved in 94 and then, um, so that year it was the biggest culture shock of my life because I went from Tokyo to Oklahoma City. So I went, oh, and then the bombing happened. So, oh. so that was um, an adjustment in itself. And then, the, um, you know, going from this high intense, you know, music, 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 music. And then I actually took a hiatus from violin for four years. Mm -hmm. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it anymore, the pressure. So, and I think that was probably the best thing for me was just taking a break and really reassessing what's important to me, you know, taking a step back from that. So I guess that's my long answer to you. No, is, it's, it's uh, well, very well said. Can I ask how, with the experience that you both had growing up in that uh, atmosphere, how has that impacted your own studios and the students that you work with? How do you foster a collaborative environment that you know uh, is supportive uh, with your own students? Okay, I'll go first. Um, um, because I had those experiences as a child. Um, because I had like the hardcore tiger mom, like you know that book, The Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mom, I think that's the book. Like that book was my life. That was, I felt like when I was reading that book, I was like reading my own biography. Um, like I had never been to a birthday party. I'd never been to a sleepover. I had never traveled. Like I practiced six hours a day and that was my childhood. And mm -hmm. so I, it, it got that suffocating that I didn't, and I even actually was like anti-Suzuki. I was anti-teaching. I was anti-violin for a long period of my life. That's why I was, you know, I studied pre-med and I had to discover the passion for violin and for music myself and really rediscover it. And so now as a teacher, I realized that I really, want my students to just enjoy it. Like, I don't want to be that type of teacher that, um, you know, and everybody will have diff different reasons for doing things. They really may want to become a, you know, a professional. They may be doing it for their resume. They may be doing it because their parents force them to, or they may do it because they love it. But I don't want to, I don't want to see them end up how I was. So I will push them as much as they want to be pushed and I will back off when they want to be. And so I just kind of, I use my own personal experience as that. So that's my teaching philosophy. So. And yeah. you, you son, um, there were 
three sisters who came to me, the mother, um, and, and I, oh. they were uh, wanting me to teach, uh, but they were actually Korean. And I, I felt like I wouldn't know how to teach them properly because I didn't know uh, the behavior or what they would respond to. But I, in, in my mind, I thought, I think those uh, would be for you, son, because they're very, actually very talented. Yes. Uh, but I, I think you, son, would do a much better job. So uh, just like what Dave was saying, how did you experience and help you in, in trying to teach those three sisters and, and your other students? Oh, yes, because I think, you know, I experienced that, the, you know, like try to give them the best of both worlds because I came to America when I was 20 and I got to study with, you know, like wonderful teachers like Iquan Bay and, you know, Federico Agostini. They were you know, like great teachers, like great players. I mean, just like amazing teachers, you know, like they love, you know, what, like what they do and it's very different, right? You know, oh. the, just teaching philosophy, you know, teaching style, just the way of living was very, very different. So I, you know, and the, I mean, there's good sides and like some Korean, right. you know, like, <laughs> you, you know, the education, yeah, like system, you know, right. like sometimes you need, you know. A little bit of uh, discipline. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how I, yeah, see it. Um, Speaking of Federico Agostini, so he, the nephew of Franco Gulli, my teacher, was, so Franco Gulli was very elegant. Oh, yes. Uh, and, and, you know, it'd be like 100 degrees in uh, Indiana and very humid. Uh, he'd still be wearing a tweed jacket. Um, and, and, and I think I mentioned on, on this show before, and, you know, I, during that time everyone was smoking and he'd just be like very stylishly, but it's a big no no now. But, but his nephew, Freddy Agostini, was, was he kind of the same person? Yeah, I think so, yes. Yeah, kind very, of very elegant. And very elegant, yeah. With a little, little bit of temper. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of temper. Because it's Italian. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And yeah, very elegant man. Yeah, very, was very knowledgeable. And I mean, his playing was so like great, like Inactive. elegant. Oh, yes, yeah. So, yeah. I want to take this opportunity to transition into announcing the winners of our Nahoku Opio Young Stars program. Uh, I have to say, I was not a judge, um, and I relished the opportunity uh, over the last couple of weeks, very stressful couple of weeks, uh, as we've worked towards live performances again, to listen to all of the, the applicants. that, And I was absolutely floored at the talent that's here. And it's a real testament to the teachers that are here in Hawaii and the, the phenomenal uh, work that you all do to inspire the next generation of not just musicians who are going to be in the orchestra and in front of the orchestra, but also people who are going to be filling in the concert halls and educators and, and all of those important parts of our society. Um, you know, uh, today was one of those days where I got an email from a, a local politician talking about a STEM program, and I fired back my response that it's a STEAM program and we need arts in every aspect of our education, or else the rest doesn't matter. And so I just, I, I have to congratulate everyone who applied to the program. Uh, I wish we had, you know, an uh, unlimited amount of opportunities to perform with the symphony, and I hope someday we return to the numbers that we used to have. Um, but for this year, it is three winners that we were able to choose uh, to solo with the orchestra. This summer, uh, in the months of May, June, and July, in performances to be announced at a venue to be announced that's outdoors and in Waikiki. Uh, we are very close to an announcement, but the moment you all have been waiting for, uh, Donard, if you'll do me the favor, our first winner is uh, Miss Mira Hu on the cello. I believe that was the Schumann Cello Concerto first movement. Uh, she is a student of Nancy Masaki, I believe. Our second winner is Sophia, St oh, I'm, excuse me, 
Well, we know who the third winner is. The second winner is Aaron Nishi, uh, violin, uh, Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, and I believe her teacher is the distinguished uh, concert master of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, who was not on the judging panel. Uh, and our final uh, winner for the Young Stars this year is Sophia Stark, uh, soprano. Uh, a wonderful performance of uh, Juliet's uh, music from G Romeo and Juliet, from the Gounod. Uh, and uh, she studies, I believe, with Georgine, her mother. And her father is a violinist in the orchestra as well. So congratulations to uh, these three wonderful uh, winners of the, our first Nahoku Opio, the first of many. Uh, this was a program that we were thrilled to launch this year uh, amidst all of the challenges and one that we will continue to, to program in the future here. So stay tuned to the details on the performances. And again, congratulations to every single applicant uh, that applied. That's right. Um, our future is in good hands. And I had students uh, who won, Aaron, but I also had students who didn't win. So they all put in a lot of work and they all were the of our congratulations. Um, I did want to ask you, Yusan and Nikki, um, so Aaron, I think, um, started with uh, Helen Higa and I've also had some very talented students um, who you started, Nikki. Um, tell us about how important it is to start young students because I don't have the patience myself. I usually have a student when they're kind of already there uh, but the credit goes a lot to the, the, the teachers who start students. Um, how did, I knew you're, you have DMA, but how did you learn how to start young students? Was that sort of a trial and error? Or did you have a method beforehand from it, maybe Maestro Suzuki? Nikki first. Um, you know, when I first started, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, you know, I had my doctorate and I was only used to teaching uh, college age students. I was a teaching assistant and um, I thought I would just supplement my income by teaching students and I was very lost. Um, so I thought, okay, well, I need to do something here. Um, and so I uh, thought the Suzuki method is uh, where I'll start since I have a background in it. And so. Um, I actually educated myself with uh, teacher training in the Suzuki method um, and every summer I went and started and um, and I actually kind of realized that this is where my 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 uh, my passion was um, and the more I did it the more I got hooked on it and um, the more I educated myself in it and um, and uh, yeah, that's just kind of and I continue to actually I, I, I do it and I continue to take courses in it, and I'm doing it online even. Wow. I love it, actually. And you somehow... Same here, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, at first, I didn't know what I was doing either, but I still, yes, yes study, take courses, and... Um, yeah, but at IU, I took pedagogy uh -huh. class with Mimi Zweig, a oh, no. renowned Very, pedagogue, yeah, and yes. that helped, helped me a lot. She started Joshua Bell, essentially, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, but starting, well, like, starting kids yeah. is so important. It's so important. Yeah, because, yeah, like, if they have bad habits, it's so hard to it's undo very hard those. To fix. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, um, I forgot exactly how old your kids are, Nikki, and, 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 and you, son, you have, you have a. Almost one, a year and almost, a half. Almost a year and a half. Do you have sort of a plan for her, for them? Uh, or does the father says, I know Nikki, your, your husband is not into a, a musician, but so is it, does the, one of the parents say, okay, this kid's gonna do music and then also soccer, or how do you come up to an agreement? Uh, well, my kids are uh, almost eight and 10, um, and my eight, well, she's eight in two days, so uh, we'll call her eight. She uh, studies cello with uh, Nancy Masaki and uh, loves it. And my son uh, studies piano with uh, Miss Bichuan Lee. Um, and um, they, uh, one likes to practice more than the other. So uh, <laughs> we'll just say uh, I shove him down at the piano bench every day. But 
Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of fighting that goes on, but uh, he knows he can't quit till he's 18, so he doesn't. And um, but we we do it, and my husband is more in charge of the academics. And uh, um, but but it's it's a daily struggle, but. Oh. Uh, we manage. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like every parent? Yeah, every parent. Uh, you, yeah. son, do you have uh, any plans or do, 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 do uh, Mike and yourself uh, say, oh, look at her hands or look at her ears or she blah, blah, blah? Or <laughs> well, my uh, husband says she looks like a, like a soccer player. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's Mia but... Hamm or uh, <laughs> Megan Rapino. Anyway. But uh, so will you most likely start her on piano or directly violin, you think? Oh, violin. <laughs> oh, um, I don't know. No, 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 but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, my, uh, the colleague of uh, like my husband uh, said uh, the, there's great program Taiko Tot. Do you know? No, it's of course I wouldn't. <laughs> really? Yeah, Taiko. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, for little kids. So, yeah. you know, when she's oh. like old enough, we want to sign up for you know, like a taiko lesson. Very good. Uh, before Dave asks you his uh, <laughs> usual final question, I, I, uh, Nikki, you and I were talking, it was like a few months ago, and the vaccines were um, starting to being distributed to, to, to the population. Um, but you actually took uh, some very big step because if you were a teacher and you were eligible in, in phase 1B, I believe, but uh, a lot of teachers are self-employed and, and, and many of them are members of HMTA, but you were able to have um, the state kind of uh, um, sign up, have those uh, self-employed teachers sign up to be eligible. How did you manage to do that? Well, it's actually thanks to you, you kind of urged me to, you pushed me to do it, but oh, um, no, you did. <laughs> I was I didn't have the courage to do it, but um, yeah, a lot of um, music teachers um, and are self-employed, and so we weren't able to get the to prove our eligibility. So I, I realized that I was in a position, um, at, you know, as the president of this organization, to contact the Department of Health, and um, so I made a lot of phone calls and wrote some letters and emails and. Um, and with Iggy's support too, we were able to um, finally get approval for the vaccine. And I, I will say as a disclaimer, you know, we're not trying to, as, as this organization, we're not trying to endorse, um, you know, the vaccine and we're not pushing our members to do that. It's a, it's a personal choice. But, you know, for those that wanted it, you know, we, we were able to get eligibility for those members who needed it because um, it, it was a very difficult process for self-employed members because we we were uh, eligible as music teachers. And it was important at that time because you... At the time, we were, we've been, you know, during the shutdown of, um, yes, yeah, so during 2020 and when things did open up, music teachers were one of the first, to, were first people right. to be um, allowed to go back to work. So, so, so I hope you can tell the uh, National uh, Association, MTNA, to, of, of your accomplishments. Uh, maybe someone else can. I don't know if I should call them. Be like, guess what I did? But, um. <laughs> well, Dave? Yes. Well, we need to hear the answer of the okay. quiz question this evening. Yes, so, uh, the answer is three. So Brooke wrote uh, three violin concertos. And, and you said that uh, the first one is the only one that people ever oh, yeah. played, but what did Max Brooke think of the other two? Oh, he was very um, you know, sad that you know, people didn't play his second and third concerto. He thought they were like, just as good as his first one. So. All right. Tune in next week when Iggy performs the second and third <laughs> Brooke violin concertos. Well, we have your choice. You have your choice. <laughs> yes. uh, the question that I pose at the end of every show is, what does the future of the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra, of symphonic music, what does it look like? And my favorite is to ask two educators who are also talented orchestra musicians. Future, I think it's like um, it's going to be very like diverse and creative. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of you know like cross between like mm -hmm. genres, you know, mediums, yes. or and also you know like um, the 
the, with the technology, yeah. you know, uh -huh. like anything's possible. So mm -hmm. it's going to be very exciting. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, I mean, the future is in our 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 students, and and I mean, they are future entrepreneurs and and you know our leaders, and so we really need to target target them. And I agree that technology. I mean, if you look at the way they're learning right now, it's all about technology and, and uh, media, and so I think that's that's a future that we should in, um, embrace. Mm -hmm. Great. As difficult it is, but yeah. yeah. Well, I want to thank you both for joining Iggy and I tonight. It was an absolute pleasure to get to spend time with you both, and I look forward to seeing you on stage very soon here as we return to live performances which we're close to announcing. Uh, and thank you all for your continued support uh, during these uncertain times. The future is bright because of uh, the children and because of our educators and the tremendous talent we have here in Hawaii. And I want to congratulate Sophia and Mira and uh, Aaron one more time this evening. We're looking forward to your performances this summer and I know that this community is looking forward to seeing you in front of our own orchestra here in Hawaii. So Iggy, anything else? It was a beautiful evening and thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful. We'll see you next Tuesday. We have a very special guest lined up for next week. Aloha. Thanks. Life changed so fast. During COVID, we've had a chance to think about what's really important in our lives. The arts are an expression of what it's like to be human. To feel, to help us make sense of our world. Does it mean anything if no one sees it? Training and dedication are stronger than any virus. We all need to express ourselves. Keep doing the things that make you happy. So when the lights come back up, we'll, we'll all be ready. ready. For the last 24 years, your nonprofit Historic Hawaii Theater has helped millions of people explore and experience the wonder of music, theater, and culture. From school plays to Broadway shows, from the Brothers Cast to the Beach Boys, we've transported you from Hawaii to the moon and back. Won't you become a member today and help preserve this last remaining historic show palace? Go to hawaiitheater.com, become a member today. We can't do it without your support. Follow.